Welcome back to The Determinants of Health. In this lecture, we're going to talk about one of the most important of the determinants of health, this amorphous thing called SES, or socioeconomic status. And you'll find it's one of the deeper and most profound predictors of health states, and one of the ones that we like to study the most. Let's begin with this graph. This is the trend of income inequality in the United States from 1974 to 2009. And this graph shows us that the bottom 20% of earners have remained pretty much the same, earning about the same amount of money over the time. But the top 20% of earners have increased their income profoundly, almost linearly, in this 30-year period. What does that show? It shows that the gap between rich and poor is widening. It also shows that it's due mostly to gains amongst the rich. The poor have remained the poor. It's the rich who are getting richer. Why do we care? We care because you know deep down, you've seen it in your own lives, you've seen it amongst your friends, in your community, that there's something around wealth that is associated with health. Wealth and health are intimately related. But what do we mean by wealth? Let's look at this. Here we have the percentage of adolescents in households who are of fair or poor health. So we're looking at this across a variety of categories of family income. In the poorest category of family income, we find the highest percentage of poor health teenagers. Whereas in the richest families, we have the lowest percentage of poor health teenagers. <clears throat> you can probably work out why that might be, right? The rich kids have more opportunities, they're more active, they probably engage in more healthy behaviors. They're probably going to gyms or joining sports clubs or vacationing in interesting places that are more active or eating more diverse and nutritious foods. Whereas the poor kids may be at home every day after school latchkey kids we used to call them, watching TV when their parents were out working, or maybe they're eating poor quality foods. Lots of reasons come to mind, but there's no denying that income is related not just to poor health, but to poor health behavior. Look at this graph. This shows us that income is also related to crowdedness. So the wealthier a community or a family, the less likely they are to perceive themselves to be crowded. And we measure crowdedness here as more than one person per room in a given house. Why do we as health scientists care about crowdedness? Well, there are certain risks associated with overcrowding. Among them, in a crowded, dense population, we have an increased risk of disease transmission, particularly infectious diseases. Outbreaks are more common where there's more, uh, more crowding. And there's a greater burden, that should be burden, not burder, on healthcare services, right? Because there are more people in need. So there's greater stresses on the system and therefore a lesser likelihood that people will receive the care that they need in good time. And of course, if we're overcrowded, if we have people around us all the time, if we can't find privacy or time to contemplate or to be amongst our own things and our space, we're going to have psychological stress, which brings with us all kinds of other poor health behaviors. Income is also related to other kinds of health outcomes. This graph shows us that with increasing income, we have increasing life expectancy. I say here that it's life expectancy computed at age 40, but that's because we compute life expectancy at diverse, different times of our life. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of this graph. But we see here that with more income, we're more likely to live longer. This graph separates out the men and women to show that it's true women live longer than men, but that difference is less if there's high income. So much of the gap between women and men has to do with stresses of wealth. We take away those stresses and the gap between gender also disappears somewhat. That's the way the determinants of health work with each other. Some actually account for the differences or the contributions towards health or poor health made by the others. That's why we like to have multivariable analyses. So higher income is associated with better health 
and income in general is associated with health in general. Why is that? Why does higher income lead to better health? Well, higher income usually means you're able to afford better health care. In a socialized medical environment like we have in Canada, that is not as much of an issue. It's still an issue, but it's not as much of an issue because health care is somewhat free. Whether or not you're poor it doesn't affect your access to a doctor. It may affect your access to the quality of doctor, depending upon the neighborhood that you live in. Wealthy neighborhoods have more clinics, better quality clinics, maybe even better trained doctors who want to live in that area. Then in the USA, where health care is not socialized, most definitely, if you're wealthy, you're getting access to better care. If you're poor, you're getting access to poor care, if any care at all. You're also better able to access or afford better quality nutrition if you're wealthy. Health foods are more expensive than fast foods. I'm sure you've all noticed this. Go to the vending machine down the hall. What's there? It's bad food, unhealthy foods. Those are the things you can get for less than a dollar. But if you want to have uh, organic, pesticide-free, plant-based nutrition, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Therefore, Wealth is associated with good nutrition. Wealthy people are also more likely to live in safe and healthy environments. What does that mean? Well, if you're poor, you're going to live in uh, probably a rundown neighborhood with drug dealers down the corner, maybe a lot of crime, a lot of violence. You're more likely to engage in those activities if you're growing up there. You're more likely to get involved in unhealthy activities if you're a child in those environments. You're more likely to be a victim of crime if you live in those environments. So, you are in general in a less healthful environment if you are poorer, less wealthy. You're more likely to live in healthful conditions if you're wealthy. What does that mean, a healthful, uh, healthful condition? Well, uh, maybe there's a gym near you, more likely. Maybe there's grocery stores nearer to you, more likely, if you're wealthy. Maybe you're going to have friends that are more likely to behave in healthy ways. That's a big one, actually. We can best predict your healthy behaviors based upon the behaviors of the people you associate with. So it's true. Surround yourself with different kinds of people or uh, wealthier people, better educated people, people with better behaviors, you're more likely to emulate those behaviors as well. You're also more likely to be better educated if you are of higher income. And we'll get to education in a second. Now, so far we've looked at North American data, mostly. But globally, low income also means you have less access to a lot of things that are important for health. Poor people have lesser access to clean water. Therefore, they're more likely to get waterborne diseases like diarrhea. And in fact, diarrhea kills uh, millions of children around the world every year. It's one of the biggest killers of, of poor children. And it's entirely preventable uh, just by cleaning water or having access to uh, cleaning materials. Low-income people have less access to toilet services. Maybe you don't think about this, but being able to go to the bathroom in a hygienic manner, uh, in a safe way, near to your home, is something of a privilege in the world. It's something that high-income people take for granted. It's something that low-income people have to fight for. If you're poor, you're less likely to have good shelter. You're less likely to be able to keep out the elements, the environment that may damage you in some way. You're also less likely to keep out criminals or people who want to hurt you. Globally, of course, low income means you're going to have poor nutrition, likely. You can't afford um, complex proteins or healthier foods or a variety of veg vegetables in your diet. Low income definitely means that globally you're going to have less access to health services, less access to vaccination, less access to prenatal care if you're pregnant, less access to uh, care if you're injured or become sick. Not just treatment, but prevention as well. Critically, low income means you're going to have less access to health information. You may not know about vaccinations. You may not know about how to clean your foods appropriately. You may not know about um, how to have a diverse diet to keep yourself fit. These are things we take for granted because our society is wealthy enough that we are inundated with the appropriate health information. Poor communities aren't so lucky. 
Now, the relationship between income and health isn't linear. It isn't always about poor is bad and rich is good. So this graph shows us the inverted U-curve of wealth and obesity. We like to think, in this society, that obesity is a disease of the moderately poor. And it's true. If you are of low income, you're probably eating less quality food, probably exercising less, so you're more likely to be obese. Those are people over here. But, but if you're really poor, you can't afford food, so you're going to be thin. Conversely, if you're really rich, you can afford the best quality foods, you can exercise a lot, you have free time to do so, you're going to be thin. But if you're moderately wealthy, you're probably buying a lot of food and not moving about a lot. So that's why we have this complicated inverted U relationship. This was a study done in 2011 looking at patterns of hand washing amongst mothers in southeastern Togo. And they found that education was an important predictor of whether or not mothers wash their hands with soap. So low educated women tended not to, and the highest educated tended to do so. Right? Why is that important? Because hand washing is an important strategy and behavior for preventing diarrhea. If the mothers are doing it, it's likely the children will do it. So we like to focus on things that mothers do as predictors of what society will do as a whole. So this tells us that higher education is associated with better health behaviors. We've seen that income is a predictor. Now we're seeing that education is a predictor. And as we mentioned, income is also a predictor of education. So this is a complicated soup. Staying on the education track, we see here that higher educated people are less likely to smoke. I'm sure you see this in your own life. Look around amongst your friends. Who are the ones who smoke? Who are the ones who don't smoke? The ones who don't smoke are probably the ones who don't have as much of an education. So, higher education is associated with better health behaviors. Why is that? Well, better education gives us a better understanding of the relationships between behaviors and health. We can't pretend we don't know that smoking is bad for our health. If you're educated, you likely know that certain foods are bad for your health. If you're educated, you know that you need to move around and sitting too much is bad for your health. Some of the basics. Also, education gives you access to services that empower healthy behaviors. What do I mean? Well, let's say you're trying to quit smoking. If you're poorly educated, you may not know how to do that. If you're well educated, you'll know that there are products and services and workshops and classes and specialists you can go to to help you do so. You're able better to navigate health services if you're educated. Do you know who to go to if you have a specific health concern? Sure, go to your family doctor, but you can also call uh, a nurse practitioner. Maybe you can visit a massage therapist or see a physiotherapist. So better education allows us to understand the complexities of our healthcare system and know where to go to to get our particular challenges addressed. If you're better educated, you're more likely to be surrounded by like-minded people. What does that mean? Well, if you are surrounded by people who are active and fit, you are more likely to become active and fit. If you're surrounded by people who don't smoke and who drink less, you are more likely to not smoke and to drink less. The people you're surrounded by have a profound effect on your healthy behaviors. And if you're better educated, you're more likely to be surrounded by people who influence you in a positive way with respect to healthy behaviors. Now we have this amorphous thing called social class or social prestige, which We'll talk about more in a future lecture, but I want to introduce it here. Because there's something around social class or social prestige which also has an influence on healthy behaviors. This graph shows us the proportion of people who abstain from drinking alcohol. So we accept that not drinking alcohol is a healthy behavior. We see here that upper class people people with high social prestige abstain more than lower class people. If you're lower class, 
whatever that means. We'll define that in a future lecture. If you're lower class, you're more likely to drink, which is unhealthy. Now, we've divided up these data by gender. <clears throat> and we find that women are more likely to abstain than men, regardless of social class. But among the lower class, they're really more likely to abstain. So, when we talk about these determinants of health, we have to understand that the uh, variety of levels of determinants affect each other in a complex manner. So we like to break things down by different groups. I can break this down further by age or by geography and find interesting patterns as well. <clears throat> so health behavior is associated with social class. Let's talk more about smoking, because smoking is such a fascinating and important topic when understanding the determinants of health, especially since smoking is about behavior. So, the text here says, tobacco is not an equal opportunity killer. Individuals in certain communities are more at risk to become smokers and suffer from tobacco-related disease and death. What does that mean? It means that different people are not at the same risk. For some reason, different communities approach smoking in different ways, we can predict how they're going to do so based upon these measurements of socioeconomic status, the ones we've talked about already, income, education, and social class. Keep in mind that different communities are approached by tobacco companies in different ways. For example, tobacco advertising sees larger signs and a lot more ads in poor neighborhoods than they do in rich neighborhoods. This might happen for a lot of reasons. Maybe poor neighborhoods have more permissible zoning laws that allow this kind of advertising. But one thing's for sure, tobacco advertising is targeted specifically and intentionally towards poorer, lower class communities because they know that's where the uptake is greatest. It's a marketing strategy and it works. This chart shows us that smoking <clears throat> is highly correlated with income. So, those who make the most money are least likely to say that they smoke. Those who make the least money are, are most likely to say that they smoke, except those that are really, really poor are slightly less likely to smoke. And that might be for a lot of reasons, including the fact that maybe they can't afford to smoke. In fact, if we look at these data and we understand that controlling smoking can be done in a variety of ways. One of them is through price control, which is why a lot of public health campaigns involve a regressive taxation on tobacco. Regressive tax talks about different taxation rates depending upon your income level. But if tobacco is taxed highly, that means that you're really punishing the poor people who can't afford it. But if you're addicted and you're poor, you're going to hurt a lot because the chunk that comes out of your income to pay for cigarettes is a much bigger proportion of the chunk that comes out of a wealthy person's pocket. Looking at British data for a second, around World War II, children born in that era tend not to have as much of a smoking behavior growing up as do the people born in the generation before and after. The reason for that is that cigarettes were not commonly available to British people during World War II. The cigarettes were exported to the soldiers in the field in Europe. So they were not available to the young people being born in that era. If they were available, they were incredibly expensive. As a result, people then did not develop a smoking habit. Now when the war is over, the cigarettes came back, the prices were lowered, and people develop smoking habits again. But those individuals born at the time when the cigarettes were not available never developed as much of a smoking habit, and they took that healthy behavior into their old age with them. That's fascinating, isn't it? <clears throat> so this graph shows us, once again, tobacco use as a function of income. And once again, those who make the most money are less likely to smoke. And this looks at tobacco smoking as a function of education. And we see here that if you are well educated at the university level, you are much less likely to smoke than if you just have a high school education or a community college education. Those who struggled to get even a high school education are the ones that are profoundly more likely to smoke. So, why do 
poor people and less educated people, why are they more likely to smoke than are the wealthy and the more educated? A lot of reasons come to mind. As mentioned, tobacco companies target these communities, the poor communities, and therefore encourage the habit. Second, maybe there's something around the stresses of living in poverty. Maybe one is more likely to feel helpless and hopeless. If so, then you're going to turn to cigarettes or other kinds of uh, poor health behaviors to feel a little bit better as a coping mechanism. People in low-income, low-educated environments are often also people subject to various kinds of abuse. Survivors of abuse also turn to smoking for psychological coping reasons. Social isolation is a big part of poverty. Think about single mothers who have to work during the day and at night they're stuck with small children, not a lot of energy or time or resources left over for socializing. They are extremely, profoundly isolated, and that very often leads to comfort-seeking behaviors, including, most commonly, smoking. Let's say you are a poor person who is working on an everyday factory job, and you're trying to quit. But the people around you are also smoking. You are less likely to succeed in quitting because the people around you aren't going to quit. So now, the barrier in front of you for stopping this unhealthy behavior is much greater than it would be if you weren't surrounded by these people. Wealthy people who work in offices are much less likely to smoke and therefore are less exposed to smokers and therefore if they do smoke it's a little easier for them to quit. Also if you're poor you have a lot less access to smoking cessation programs which is why these products that are available in the drugstore these uh, patches and gums are so important and useful. When we think about the reasons today that certain communities are more likely to smoke than others, we're tempted to look back at the smoking, anti-smoking campaigns from decades past. So for a while, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of billboards and ads were put up with text, complicated texts, talking about the evils of smoking, how much it damages your body, and how you should, how you should stop. But think about the selective biased effect those kinds of campaigns have. They're more likely to be seen by educated people. In fact, they are commonly placed around university campuses. And because of um, the highly dense text nature of those campaigns, they're more likely to be digested and appreciated by educated people. As a result, differentially, more educated people received the anti-smoking messaging than did less educated people. And as a result, decades later, the result was that we see a difference in smoking rates between the more educated and the less educated. So this means we need to really tailor our public health messaging campaigns in a strategic way so as not to create greater divides in society than already exist. So, these things we're talking about, income, education, social class, these are all dimensions of this larger construct that we call socioeconomic status, or SES. It is a combination, I mentioned, of education, income, and social class. How we combine them, well, that's another story, and we'll talk about that in a future lecture. And different people combine them in different ways. But we all like to use measurements of SES to understand various health distributions and health behaviors. Like this graph that divides a population between low SES, middle SES, and high SES. And we're looking at the people who have unhealthy days in a particular population. Let's say this is um, uh, a group of workers at a factory. Or it's a bunch of seniors and an old folks home, which is what this actually is. It shows that the people who are of the highest SES have the lowest number of unhealthy days. Those with the lowest SES have the highest number of unhealthy days. And we can break this down further by men and women. And we find that the difference between the two, between the two genders, is highest among the low SES and lowest among the high SES. Kind of like we saw when we looked at life expectancy. So again, the differences that we think exist between men and women go away when there's sufficient wealth, education, and class involved. Which is why it's important to do these multivariable analyses to understand the ways in which these variables play off against one another. 
Now the ways we have of measuring SES, or of computing it, or of creating composite scores, well that's complicated. And we'll do that in a future lecture. Until then, signing off.